All right, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to light our candles. Remember, we have four candles, candles of Advent, love, and the candle of hope, which we talked about a few weeks ago. And then we have the candle of joy. And then tonight, the candle of peace that we'll talk about. And then we'll start our candlelight in just a few minutes here with the Christ candle. Isaiah chapter 9 is where we're going to be this evening. Uh, you know, this time of year, silence can be difficult to find. Silence can be difficult to come by. And, and, and one of the parts of this time of year that I think we enjoy the most is time to be together when our homes are full of the sounds of family and friends and and celebration, we attend office parties, neighborhood gatherings, and worship services together. And it's so much a part of this year, this time of year. We have the opportunity for maybe unhurried, meaningful conversation with family and friends that maybe we don't get to see as much as we would like or see too often during the year. And the pace is often hurried, but the sounds of love and relationships fill our hearts, lift our spirits. And I think that's so much a part of this time of year. But interestingly, silence can be difficult to find. In Psalm 23, the psalmist there, David, the author declares this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still or quiet waters. And it was a prayerful reminder that quietness and silence before the Lord is necessary for rest and necessary for peace. Another psalmist later on says this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And that is a more forceful reminder that the nations and the followers of God often find God and know God deeper in the silence. And it's a... It's a time for us to consider and to contemplate that often in the nearness of our time with God, those moments when we can find silence and sit before him are often the times that he speaks deepest and loudest into our souls. But it seems this time of year, silence is difficult to find and it's even more elusive than ever. And you know, Advent, this season that we celebrate, it's really, it really means a time to prepare to celebrate Emmanuel or Christ that Jesus Christ came as our promised Messiah, which means that he came to be with us. And it's an intentional time of year that we, that we try our best to slow down, uh, to, to remember, to, to not find ourselves maybe in the next few weeks when a new year starts thinking, where did all that time go? Where, where did all these moments go? And do we wait for another year of hurried pace? And it's Advent, I think, offers us a time to step out of the chaos, step out of the pace step out of the hurriedness, and to consider the peace of God. The peace of God that he offers to us through the person of Jesus Christ. Yet, listen to this, we often miss the peace of God because he's ready to deliver that peace to us in the silence. And we find ourselves constantly caught in the chaos. And the peace of God we desire for our lives is often delivered to us in the quiet moments in the silent moments, those times when we can shut out the noise, shut out the chaos, shut out all that's going on and simply hear the voice of the Lord. And I think what Christmas season provides us, although there's so many joys that it provides, it presents us with this tension of of striving to find peace in the presence of chaos, striving to find those moments to really hear from God, trying to find those moments to be with God in the midst of all the chaos. And maybe what we need most this Christmas Eve is simply a moment of silence so that God can speak his peace, his promised peace into our lives. But silence can often be difficult to find. I want to read Isaiah chapter 9, the first seven verses to anchor just a few thoughts that we're going to have together tonight. It says this in verse 1, But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest, as they are glad when 
they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, And of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And church, don't you want this promised peace that scripture says will have no end? I know in my life, in my heart, in the chaos of all that's around us, I desperately want the promised peace of God over my life. The peace of God that he says is not circumstantial, doesn't happen just in a moment, but it's an everlasting peace that has no end. And what's interesting about silence and these moments to hear from God is the prophets foretold the coming Messiah, prophets like Isaiah. Yet they did not know that soon and very soon after these prophecies were given, that the voice of God would go quiet. And as they waited for the voice of God and for his promise to return, they faced a time of silence. We talked about this here, church, a few weeks ago. Where between the Old and New New Testament, this intertestamental period, there was 400 years where no one heard a fresh word from God. 400 years where the prophets didn't speak a new revelation to the people. 400 years where generation of God's people after generation of God's people waited in silence to hear from God. But in his time, God once again spoke to his people when the time had come. And his message of peace tore through that silence. And his message of peace after all these generations of silence was that a Christ would be born. A Messiah would be born. And this is the message that they heard after all of this silence. Joseph Moore was a, was a young foster child. And he was born in Salzburg, Austria. And he had other siblings, and like his other siblings, he was born out of wedlock, which made uh, his life as a young boy in 17th century Austria very difficult. And so his father, who was a mercenary soldier, had abandoned the family. His mother either could not or would not care for him. And so because she was unwilling to care for him and her others, they had to find places to live. And so... Joseph was taken in by a devout man who served as the choir master in the local Catholic cathedral there in 17th century Austria. And the man's name was Johann, and he took Joseph in as a foster child, and he raised him in the church, and he taught them the things of God, and he taught them the things of church, and he quickly discovered that Joseph was a masterful musician, and he had a very unique gift of song. And as he excelled in his education and his musical giftings in the church, Joseph decided for himself on a life of priesthood. Especially in the area of choral music. That music that rang out from the church and churches like it. Especially on Christmas Eve Mass. And so at the age of 19, Joseph entered seminary. And at the age of 23, he was finally ordained in the church. And he served his first church in the village where his grandfather had lived. A little village called Mariafar, and he wrote a poem during his first time as a priest, and he wrote a little poem to himself called Steely Knocked. And historians believe that that young Joseph, when he was leading his first congregation, was inspired by this painting of the birth of Christ that was on a, a local building next to where his parish was. And so as he looked at this painting day after day after day, it inspired him, and he wrote these words to this poem. But he became very ill, which meant he had to return back to his hometown of Salzburg. And he served the church there while he was able to heal and get better from the illness that he had in his life. Once he recovered, they sent him off again to another church in a town called Oberndorf. And he served the church there. He became friends with another priest that was serving there, who was the church organist and choral leader, a man named Franz Gruber. And they became fast friends. And so it's the winter of 1818, and they're preparing for Christmas Eve Mass, which was by far their biggest and best gathering of the calendar year. But the dampness of the nearby river had corroded the pipes to the beautiful organ that people came to hear. 
And so the organ that night was silent. And so the church for the first time ever was facing Christmas mass with no music. Christmas mass would be a silent night. And so Franz Gruber was obviously greatly distressed. He had been rehearsing with the village choir for so many months, preparing to have the organ with them to lead them in these songs of the season. But they were going to be able to not have the organ accompany them. And it would be unthinkable at the time to do these songs without the beautiful organ of the church. And at the same time, Joseph, this priest who is now well and ready, he is equally distressed and he had overcome so much in his life. And here's this young foster child who the hand of God had been on his life. And now he has this moment in this beautiful church with this beautiful organ to lead this Christmas mass. And he's remembering how much God had done in his life. But yet the dream of leading Christmas mass without the sounds of the beautiful pipe organ was unthinkable to them. And so these two church leaders in the days leading up to Christmas Mass, they were so discouraged and they were so distraught. And so early that morning of December 24th in 1818, they gathered together and simply said, we've got to figure out something to do to lead the people. And they knew it was too short notice to do anything that the choral, the choir could do that they'd rehearsed. But Joseph had remembered his guitar. And so he sat down with his guitar with Franz Gruber and he said, hey, I've got this poem that I wrote a little while back. Let's see if we could do something with it. And there's this poem that was called Stilly Knock or what we call Silent Night. And within just a few minutes, Franz Gruber had composed the music with the words of the poem and the song that we now know as Silent Night was birthed on Christmas Eve in 1818. And although it was unheard of at the time, these two priests stood before their church and sang a duet with pipe organs in the background, with a simple acoustic guitar called Silent Night. And they didn't know that Silent Night would become the most popular Christmas carol that has ever been translated in countless languages more than any other song. And it's become famous almost by accident because a couple of frustrated pastors were trying to find something to put before their people because the organ had stopped working. And I can almost picture in 1818 all the, those that had gathered to hear the beautiful sounds of this organ and they see their two pastors stand up with a guitar and lead them in the duet of a song that they'd never heard of. And I can imagine the discouragement on the faces of so many had they been waiting all year for the beautiful sounds of Christmas Mass. And I think it's so interesting that instead of the bellowing sound of this beautiful organ, they simply heard a couple of faithful pastors sing a poem they had written not too long before the service even began, called Silent Night. And isn't it ironic that it was from a fear of a silent service that the song of Silent Night was composed? And it reminds us, church, listen, silent nights often pave the way to holy nights. Silent nights often pave the way to holy nights. So here's my question for you. Do you have peace with God in your life? Do you have peace with God? Not circumstantial peace from doing things you enjoy with people and you enjoy being around people that you love, and not, nor the peace that comes from being a person that has a positive outlook on life or an optimistic outlook on the world around you. Do you have real peace? The only peace that can come from the person of Jesus Christ who came to be with us. And here's what I want us to consider for this Christmas Eve, is that silent nights pave the way to holy nights. And it's in those moments where we will finally shut out all the noise and be alone with God and be silent before God that silence is often the pathway to our own holiness. And did you know that sometimes we're so fearful of what God might have to say to us? Sometimes we're so scared of the truths or the corrections that the Holy Spirit might want to make in our lives that we keep our lives so busy, we keep our minds so filled, and we keep our hearts so hurried because we're fearful of what it might look like for us if we would simply sit and be alone and have some silent night with God. But I want you to consider what this means because our lives are so filled with noise relationships, hobbies, jobs, activities, and so much more. And we run hard from morning until our head hits the pillow. But have you ever considered that when our lives are absent of the silent moments, we rarely, if ever, have time to hear from God? In the pace of our lives, do we ever have a moment that we've carved out where we simply sit and say, God, I need to hear from you. 
I need this peace that you promised, this everlasting peace that the prophets gave us, this peace that has no end that we see in Isaiah 9. God, I need that peace in my life. And so I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause. I'm going to do everything I can do to shut out everything else because I need in this moment to hear from you. And have you ever paused your life long enough to hear the voice of the Lord? Did you know that it's likely that God is whispering to you in your chaos, whispering to you in the hurriedness of your life, trying to cut through the noise so that he can introduce you to peace, which means he wants to introduce you to his son, the Christ who came that we celebrate. His son who is the Messiah, the promised one, Emmanuel. You see, I think the whispers of God in our lives are because he wants to remind us where peace comes from. He wants to remind us that silent nights pave the way to holy nights and silence is often the pathway to holiness and to peace with God. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, he teaches us this. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Tim Keller in his recent book, Hidden Christmas, recalls this. And I quote, there are three ideas in Emmanuel. He is God. He is human, and he is with us. And that's what Emmanuel means. That's what peace is. It's the idea that Jesus came to be with us. He came to meet us in our silent nights, our silent moments, and lead us to peace, and lead us toward holiness, and lead us back to himself. You see, in her silence, the angel came to Mary and shared with her the good news of the gospel of the coming Messiah, that she was going to carry the Christ. And in his silence, the angel came to Joseph and shared with him the goodness of the gospel, that he would be the earthly father of the Messiah and the husband of the one who would carry our Savior. And in their silence, a host of angels came to the shepherds and shared with them the good news of the gospel, that the Messiah had been born for all people. And in their silence, a star alerts what we call the wise men to the good news of the gospel, that the Messiah had been born And church, listen, in my silence, as a wayward and sinful college student in 1996, the Holy Spirit of God whispered into my life that I could find peace with God through a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. And my life's never been the same. When I paused long enough on a dark, rainy beach in Panama City Beach, Florida, to hear the word and the voice of God, He whispered and said, if you want this peace that you're looking for and every other thing, it only comes by way of my son, Emmanuel. Because he came to be with us. And in my silence, he invited me into a relationship with the Messiah, the Christ. So what about you? What what is your moment where you paused? There was a time in your life where you were slowed down enough and quiet enough to hear the voice of God whisper to you that he loves you, that he's for you, that he forgives you. That he sent his son as your redeemer and he invites you to surrender your life and follow him. When was that moment for you? When was that moment of quiet where the still small voice of God screamed loudly in your ear that you desperately needed a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ? So are you and I ready this Christmas to step out of all the noise and sit in silence so that we can hear the whispers of God to us the good news of joy that the Messiah has indeed come and he's come for us. Daniel Darling in his book called The Characters of Christmas explains it this way. He says, and I quote, the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But the original language really tells us it is about peace in earth toward men of goodwill. In other words, listen to this. In other words, those who experience peace are those who have had their hearts cleansed by the sacrifice this Christ child was to bring. Listen, church, there is no other way to peace except through the work of Jesus Christ by way of the manger finished on a cross. That's the only way you and I have peace. And if we are looking for peace or trying to find peace in anything other than that, we are fooling ourselves and we're setting ourselves up for hopelessness and for chaos. The only way to peace is through the Christ, the Messiah, the child that has come. And so I want to encourage you in this. When you find your silence, you'll find your peace. When you can find your silence, you'll find your peace. When you can stop and pause your life long enough, I will make you a promise based on the promises of God. He will meet you in your silence and extend to you peace. Peace that comes through his son. Not peace that comes through having better habits or having resolutions or modifying our behavior in other ways. Simply peace by following 
the person of Jesus Christ. God's drawing you to himself into silence to meet with you and to remind you about his son because silent nights paved the way to holy nights. Silent nights paved the way to peaceful nights. And it's often in those quiet moments that we hear the voice of the Lord. And I want to invite you right now into the silence of this moment. It's an invitation just to simply sit quietly before the Lord and listen to his voice. What is he speaking into your silence this Christmas Eve? Is this service or another service that you'll go to? Is this just something your family does? Are you really looking for peace? Is this just something you do this time of year? Or are you really looking for something different in your life? Are you really looking for some measure of peace that can only come from the person of Jesus Christ in your life? Are you willing right in these moments to sit in silence and ask God to meet you there? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes just for a moment. There's nothing special, magical about doing that. I want to offer you a chance for a moment of reverence between you and the Lord. Is he calling you out of your sin and into his holiness through the salvation he offers? If God's calling you to salvation in your silence, then right where you are, ask him to forgive your sins. Make the decision to repent of those sins, which means to turn away from yourself and turn toward him. Surrender your life to him. Allow him the rightful place as Lord and Savior of your life. And follow closely to him and live only in obedience to him. And if in your silence he's calling you to salvation, then right now be obedient. Or maybe in your silence he's calling you out of apathy and he's calling you into a meaningful relationship with him. Maybe you'd say, McLean, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but I have no ongoing relationship with his son. I I, I trust God, I know God, but I am not in an ongoing, growing, intimate relationship with Christ. Maybe in your silence he's calling you out of your apathy. And maybe where you are you can ask his forgiveness for your apathy, for your self-righteousness, and surrender again your life to him. And make a commitment to follow him as Lord and to obey what he asks you to do. Or maybe in your silence he's calling you to take your next steps on your spiritual journey. Maybe that step is baptism. Maybe it's serving him more. Maybe it's giving, being more generous with what he's given you. Maybe it's forgiving someone that's wronged you and working toward restoration in a hurt relationship. Maybe it's stepping out of an addiction and stepping toward a path of healing. Whatever it may be, maybe in the silence, he's asking you to be obedient. I want to invite us just for a few moments more of silence. And God, I ask you in these next few moments as we silently sit, that God, you'd meet us, speak to us, give us clarity even now. Jesus, it's hard for us to really, in a human way, understand what you've done for us. We read the stories of the scriptures and we, we try our best to wrap our minds and hearts around the ways that you came and why you came. But God, it's, it's really hard for us to grasp that you came for people like us. You came for sinners like us, people that had rejected you, people that are far from you, people that chose to be the Lord of our own lives. God, it's... it's It's difficult for us to understand. But you tell us your ways are higher than our ways and that we just simply don't understand. But by faith, we trust you. We trust your promises. And God, we trust that you want to give us your peace. We trust that you want to speak to us in our times of chaos. And so God, we are asking you to help us. We are asking you, Holy Spirit, to help us find a moment where we can sit still before the Lord. And God, as we do, we pray you would speak deeply and clearly into our hearts. God, we desperately need this peace that Isaiah said would have no end. 
So God, forgive us where we've held on to superficial or temporary peace in our circumstances or in relationships. And God, give us the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that comes from you by way of your son, Jesus Christ, who we celebrate. Because God, the only hope for our lives, the only way that we can have joy, the only way that we can love is when we have an overwhelming sense of an everlasting peace in our hearts that comes from you. And God, if there's anybody in this room tonight or watching on the live stream that does not have peace with God, God, may today be their day of salvation. May they put their faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.